Hartwig, did you hear the play on music that was used? No. By one of your artists? Which one? John Legend. Good. <laughs> did you recognize that music from the soundtrack of La La Land? Great song, best song in the whole soundtrack. I think they're all still at lunch, Hartwig. I can't hear anybody. Are you here or are you dead? Well, let's hear you. Come on, make Hartwig feel welcome. He's come all the way from Berlin, lots of miles. He was at the Rolling Stones concert when on uh, Saturday, Saturday night. night. Yep. Immediately Great after. Show. Super. Because you published the Rolling Stones, right? Yes. Oh, I need the clicker. And I got a ticket for free. You, you get a free ticket? Yeah. So, but you didn't get the catalog of their songs for free? No, but the ticket. Oh, good. Well, at least you got something for free from those guys, because the only thing you get free from them is air. And they played a wonderful show. They are great. Absolutely amazing. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the first slide, please, Dickie. So, uh, first of all, Hartwig, great uh, welcome to you. Uh, um, just want to ask the technical people, can you actually see us? Are we in the right... Lighting, or should we move the chairs a little further forward? Okay? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a real privilege for us to have Hartwig with us because there's an interesting story. Hartwig himself is a really uh, tremendous creative professional who started out as a freelance music producer after studying economics at university. And then for the last very many decades has been a really, really distinguished music publisher um, responsible for finding, developing, signing talent and now is the uh, chief executive of BMG which is the newest major company and Hartwig, uh, on this basis, we're just showing this on the slide you can see on the screen there um, BMG, which is a subsidiary of Bertelsmann, and for people who are not familiar with Bertelsmann, how many of you know Penguin Books? That's Bertelsmann. Uh, it's a Fremantle TV. A bigger pardon? Fremantle TV production. Fremantle, uh, yeah. that's right. Very important uh, Australian originated company, also owned by Bertelsmann, the parent. Um, and um, Hartwig has. Um, uh, basically been charged with the responsibility since 2008 because you basically saw something amazing you'd been involved BMG uh, was involved for many many years as a um, as a record company um, and if you think Sony started in 1929 um, Universal 1934, Warner Music Group uh, 1958, and here you are starting something in 2008 from scratch. From scratch, and uh, it was obviously, well, that's where we come from, middle of nowhere in Germany. The middle of nowhere? <laughs> middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, we, we relaunched, I, I probably we, we didn't really start it, we relaunched and redesigned BMG because the logo you just saw was the old BMG, which uh, basically goes back to 59, so there is a history in the old BMG, but we decided around 2005 to really have a very intense look at what digitization will mean to our industry. And, uh, and the result of that very long thinking was we better get out and start from scratch because to re-engineer a company with 5,000 employees and uh, offices in 42 countries to completely embrace digital change, we thought, will not work. Let's, let's go and start from scratch. So, uh, so you sold off all of the old assets? Yes, we sold uh, our... I mean, we, we had 50% in Sony BMG as a consequence of a merger with Sony, so we sold uh, our 50% to Sony in uh, 2008, and two years before we had sold already the publishing company to Universal and basically first two of billion all, dollar transaction two billion two yeah. billion yeah billion yeah it was a lot of money a lot of money yeah, it was good uh, so uh, and 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 we really then started first of October 2008 with a very very small team to design a company that we hopefully uh, thought would be fit for a complete digitally driven music business so if you look at this map that little dot that you see the pin actually is of a town called Gutersloh, yes. which was there where the original Bertelsmann was founded and developed. Yes. And today, of course, Bertelsmann is a $20 billion turnover yep. business, yep. of which the music in, uh, end is extremely uh, important, a priority within the, the, the company. 
Yeah, I mean, main business is uh, broadcasting. Uh, we, we own the RTL group, we own, uh, uh, we own Fremantle, we now own 75% in Penguin Random House. So music right now is more a very important initiative, but in the total mix of sales, obviously still very small compared to uh, giants like the RTL group, one of the biggest European broadcasting company, or Penguin Random House being the biggest book publisher in the world. But uh, obviously looking at the trends in, in entertainment and, and media, music is extremely expo important now to, to a company like Bertelsmann. By the way, important to point out, why can they make drastic decisions? It's a company that's owned by a family, so they don't have to watch uh, uh, stock market analysts. They don't really have to watch what they do. They do it for their own long-term strategy. And that actually probably is important if you want to drastically change a company in that size. So one of your main objectives as the leader of this business was you wanted to acquire companies that were important, but the explicit objective of the company, which I really love hearing this because it's so unusual and different, the objective of what you do is to make things better for artists and songwriters. Well, and for shareholders. I mean, obviously, if you, if you dig a little deeper in the history of music industry, you find out you had a lot of unhappy people and very few very happy people if it came to money. Uh, I mean, obviously, whenever you buy a biography of uh, significant artists who look back 20, 30 years, you f will find those couple of pages where they complain that they always were fucked by their record companies and taking advantage of and, 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 and. Uh, shareholders in those companies always were nervous because they never got a real payout. So obviously, the question always was, where is the money? Well, the money somewhere went away in, in right. private planes, executive uh, payments. So our uh, shareholders said, we, we don't want to deal with a business like that. We should have a, uh, basically a, 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 every interest in that company should be represented in a fair way, which means as an investor, you should make an absolutely reasonable return. But more important, you should have happy clients. And, and obviously, the clients are the musicians and uh, people who uh, are creating the repertoire. And, and long term, in a, in a world that is getting very transparent, changing drastically with respect who actually has the leverage in that industry towards the creative side, you have to come up with a model where, where you don't run into complaints and lawsuits all the time, but, but have clients who might call in and say, actually, that was a great year, let's, let's go on, or thank you for that check, that was more than I expected. Normally, it's the other way around, you know? So really, uh, some of the core objectives is to run a company of fairness, transparency, service, and service-driven business with your creative community. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think, this is not like be because of family who owns BMG or I'm a, a, a structured good doer. I think we, we, we're addressing competitive positioning here. Right. And I think going forward, uh, we will see that artists just have more opportunities to basically enter markets. And it's not like in the good old, uh, from some perspective, good old world where, where you had this extreme bottlenecks just to enter the uh, arena. I, I think uh, digital distribution, digital uh, uh, communication tools will just change leverage towards artists and that means if you want to be part of that equation you have to come up with something that your clients value and that has to be a service that has to be a value set that actually fits their needs so it's it's a pretty strategic point to be transparent and fair in this industry going forward and although you're based in Europe you are established all over the world and you now have a very specific focus on Asia, Asia Pacific and the wider development, creative development across Asia. That's one of the things that brought you here to all that matters. Absolutely. And, and, and I think if, if, if you look at the drivers now of our business, I mean, there are a couple of really interesting panels. Uh, uh, I think Southeast Asia is becoming the hottest perspective of our industry with young consumers, uh, people very, very geared towards new technologies and, and actually probably a first in a certain way that you have access 
to the global uh, music catalog in a legitimate way. So very excited about what's going on. And obviously, very creative young people. So it's, it's not a one-way street that, that we're looking at. I, I think we see a lot of uh, young people creating incredibly important music coming from this area. And, and again, it's, it's a function of digital business models now you can you can come from everywhere and, and enter immediately a global scenario and and I think that will probably surprise in the next couple of years how much repertoire that has global relevance will not originate from the United States and, and, and from England which and, and Australia which historically were the three main uh, sources repertoire of global well. repertoire specifically right. global repertoire so this is just a seg segment of some of the more than hundred acquisitions that you've made yes and you continue to do uh, here are some key signings of Rolling Stones we spoke about there on the right. Uh, yeah, but, but other interesting stories, I mean, on the left LP, I mean, when, when people looked at um, the acquisitions we, we did, they always say, wait, wait, but you're just a Pac-Man, you just buy catalogs, there's no creative drive in that company. And, uh, well, not true, you know, we, we right now, breaking artists on a global level. We take our time. No, we don't expect them to be overnight sensations, but LP, uh, actually with three unsuccessful albums with our competitors, is, is gearing up. Uh, in the first 12 months, we sold 250,000 units. We have a number one album coming up in America with Dustin Lynch, country artist. Uh, so obviously we massively supporting uh, unknown artists to, to get to global relevance. So not just buying, very important point. So these are some signings. Let's take a look at some more. There's uh, Robbie Williams, very big all over the world. Yeah, obviously I love artists that I grew up with. So one of my main objectives is to work with as many of those that, that I adored when I was 15, 16, 17. So and Robbie, are still relevant in the global business today. And still relevant, absolutely. And getting more relevant relative to, uh, to the consumer mix. I mean, if you, if you follow digital data right now, if you follow Spotify or Apple Music, I mean, the, the relevance of established Established names is absolutely astonishing compared to five, six years ago. So Rick Astley had a very big album on your record side, 300,000 yep. albums. In England. Big alone. today, yeah, in England yeah, alone. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Janet Jackson, you had a number one with her? Yes, in the US, number one album on the recorded side. Yeah. Ah. Well, I mean, it just proves that, that uh, you shouldn't underestimate the staying power of of artists who Radar. are driven to be artists, and right. are, just, are not novelties, but, but artists who have a real clear view on what they want to deliver to their fan base. And uh, I, I think there was a little bit of problem of the last years that everybody in, 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 in the record industry wanted to prove he can find the newest talent. And some of those artists got a little bit ignored, which is a Great opportunity for us, actually. I mean, Great we, opportunity. We, this week we, we have three uh, midweek charts in, in, in England. We have three records with established artists that couldn't find a record deal before they joined us. Who's that? Sparks, uh, Sparks. Water Boys, and, and Jack Savaretti. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at some more. Uh, Nickelback, a prominent Canadian group. Great, Great success fan. so far. What, what, an incredible successful global campaign. Blondie, I mean, and you published Blondie as well, we right? Published Blondie. We put out a new record. Uh, great comeback, Blink 182. Great. Well, you had a hit with Blink 182, also number one with them. Yeah, it went to number one in America. Right. Yeah, Incredible. Yeah. So, yeah, getting there. Incredible. And um, MIA, obviously, she's from Sri Lanka. Wonderful artist, yeah. I mean, definitely proves the point, doesn't matter where you come from. Exactly. Uh, you, you connect to your audience if you create something that is interesting, you know. So, and, and, and the roads are wide open now. She's a great example. So, this is a very key piece of information we want to get across, and that is you now by any measure, compared to the three other majors, obviously the important indies, people like Beggar's Banquet, some yep. of the executives that are here, and uh, Success with Adele. And by the way, you publish two of the key songs by Adele. I think you publish, uh, uh, let me just have a quick look here. Uh, Someone Like You and Set Fire to the Rain, yep. those are two of your songs, yep. which is great. But just tell us about this particular slide here. Well, it's, it's one of the metrics we watch uh, when, we, when we basically present BMG to our shareholders as looking for the competitive profile, which is what's, what's, 
what's a real gain and a real gain in competitiveness is we, we are able to pay out more to artists. So it's, it's not only the question we, we pay out more and run at a big deficit, we, we are able to pay out more in being extremely profitable. And we think that will become a massive competitive uh, area for this industry to say, hey, we, we don't just basically say, all right, if we say, oh, we broke an artist and he's really broke afterwards, but you're able to support him financially and, and make sure he, he gets his adequate share in what was generated by his works. No we hidden wanted, deductions. Uh, Sorry? No hidden deductions. No hidden deductions. And we, we look at a lot of other areas right now, getting rid of most of the uh, audit restrictions. Just to make one point clear, we represent artists. We work with their repertoire. And that means they should absolutely be able to monitor monetization of their repertoire and get the fair share without uh, hidden agendas behind it. So that, that's one of the main areas we watch in defining our competitiveness. So this slide here, where you're growing faster than your competitors, uh, Universal not growing so fast, Sony Music, Warner's a little bit up, but uh, you are 17%. I mean, that's, that's quite dramatic, uh, Hartwig. It's yeah, I mean, but it included a couple of acquisitions. The others made right. acquisitions as well. No, but we, we have a good momentum. I mean, it was a, it was a good four years now since 2013 and, and we hope we keep the pace going. I mean, it shows at the end of the day, we think that the big companies are struggling with the impact of digitization because it's not like, it's not a free lunch. They, they have to become attractive, obviously, specifically on those metrics to their clients as well. Otherwise, clients walk away. And obviously, we have a lot of clients on the recorded side, on the publishing side, that were with our competitors three, four years ago. This requires a lot of creative intelligence, executive intelligence, creativity of thinking in terms of the way that you do things. Um, let's have a look at this uh, where you're growing faster. Uh, how about that? Yeah, well, we picked up speed over the last 12 months. You know, so. No, I mean, this is impressive stuff. Yes. It's very competitive. Yes. No, no one was waiting for you to come onto the scene. And now over a nine year period, it's, it's a steadily improving graph. Well, I mean, so far it proves a little bit the thesis. If, if, if you really want to benefit and align with digital change, you have to be drastic in changing, period. You can't just say we, we fire a couple of people here and we do a little bit of that here. And then we hope the rest stays the same and, and we sail into a glorious future, I think. There's drastic change ahead for our competitors as well. And, uh, and I'm glad we were able to make that move uh, nine years ago. Now, presently, you've got two offices in Asia, China and Japan. Yep. You operate in Beijing. Yep. And the goal clearly is to widen it. I mean, you, you've got A&R teams in seven time zones around the world. Yep. And you do see the future where there could be an Indonesian artist, a Filipino Absolutely. artist, a Absolutely. artist from all regions of China breaking through and having uh, global success. I, I completely buy into that concept. And, and I mean, you see a lot of areas uh, uh, that, that, that actually encourage that thinking. If, 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 for example, I mean, we have a huge licensing team in North America dealing with the film and TV industry. And, and it's always interesting to see how adventurous, how cutting edge film and TV directors are, where you see the rest of the music industry is always very conservative. If it comes from abroad, well, I can't basically take the laurels. I found this artist and broke this artist, which means access specifically to the US market, very limited uh, in, in specific uh, music business terms, while all the other media is, is, is very open actually to embrace new artists. So uh, we will make that point. We want to deal with talent and, and, and creativity from all over the world. And to be clear, the publishing side, the recording side, and we'll go through some of the other elements. Uh, you really have come to learn about the importance of metadata, digital data, yep. and how to provide effective uh, uh, data analytics, uh, income tracking, and uh, uh, all of these things important, as happened with these artists. Um, ah, here's something interesting. You developed a relationship with Alibaba. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, it was uh, it basically happened immediately when we looked at China uh, that we ran into very, 
I, I think, very productive discussions with the Alibaba team, specifically with Gao, and, uh, and then we just made a decision and we said, you know, we, we, we want to work with a company that, that is a little bit on the experimental uh, uh, trail as we are in what the music industry will look like, and, and three years ago basically teamed up with them in China, and it's a very, very happy experience so far. So we work on a lot of collaborations and, and ideas. I mean, we don't try basically to push existing repertoire towards our, our uh, colleagues in China. We, we don't come with traditional models. We, we have very open discussions how to jo really join forces. Okay, so in this picture, this is a very telling picture from uh, left to right uh, that you can see on the left, uh, Sherry Zhao, yep. who is the managing director of BMG in China, yep. then Thomas Raba, who My is boss. Yep. Uh, the, the chairman of uh, Bertelsmann, yep. Annabelle Long, uh, the chief executive officer of Bertelsmann China's corporate center, then Yong Fu Yu, who's the chairman of the Alibaba Entertainment Group, there in the middle in the blue shirt. Uh, Wei Dong Yang, who's the CEO of Yuku Tudu and Ali Music. Yep. There's yourself, uh, looking uh, very uh, happy, obviously. Yes. You are delighted, so knowing that delighted. the deal finally came together, because sometimes it's difficult getting deals closed in China. Uh, and then finally, on the right, is Li Juan Zheng, who is the con content corporation of digital entertainment at Alibaba Music. Uh, it looks like a very happy picture. Very happy picture and, and I mean the great thing about that relationship is immediately we can start actually working in both directions. Yeah, we get a lot of support for uh, Anglo-American artists in China right now from Alibaba but they, they make a big effort to bring Chinese artists to LA actually. So, so we have constant workshops in LA with... Wait, say that again. You've started a workshop in LA for artists from Asia. No, from, from China. From China? Yeah, we, we wow. bring Chinese artists to work with our writers, so we really have a, a cross-border situation uh, that, that works very well, actually. I mean, Chris Wu had a number one iTunes dance track recently, you know, so, in the US. You know what I think is so interesting, Hartwig? You started in exactly the same couple of months as Spotify did. Absolutely. And if you track that differential, this, the, what is similar is you're both on an upward trajectory but it also shows just how in tune you are with modern thinking, digital thinking, the digital responsibility you have to your talent for developing their careers and understanding data. But I like to say I'm very uh, able to read the future, but I didn't read the Spotify success. So I mean, obviously there was a gift from heaven that, that uh, the Spotify team created that incredible uh, 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 roadmap for all of us, you know, so uh, yeah, we are aligned, massively aligned historically now and, and, and the way we look at the industry, but yeah, great. But, I mean, by the way, it's, it's a proof of one other theory I have, you know, not, not everything that really makes sense comes from the big companies, you know, you need right. a lot of entrepreneurial initiatives to really change things, you know, so very glad that they had this crazy idea 10 years ago, you know, and we all know how they were dismissed in, in their early years by the industry, so great. And also, interestingly enough, uh, just looking at some of the legacy artists that you signed, of course, in streaming, 70% of all of the streaming is catalog uh, acts. Yeah, but uh, I mean, everybody's surprised when, when he hears it nowadays, but if you look at it and say, okay, wait a minute, one of the biggest elements in, in streaming is now you are not longer restrained by shelf space. So uh, uh, suddenly there is excess for every Shadi song or Bad Company song globally. And yeah, I mean, those were relevant artists and you don't have to drive now 10 miles to go to an electronic warehouse to buy a Bad Company CD anymore, you know? So I, I think, I mean, we didn't connect the dots at the right moment, but I think the relevance of catalog and established artists will mass be massively boosted now by, by digital uh, channels. And, and actually even transporting that music outside of the uh, territories where it al already was relevant and touring or, or, or was showed how relevant it was, I think we see a lot of those artists becoming much more relevant in, in the new markets as well. Hmm. So. so you publish The Real Slim Shady or songs from Eminem, yep. uh, the famous Boy George song, Karma Chameleon. Do you really want to hurt me? Yes, wonderful. That's a good one. 
I mean, if I go to our catalog, I mean, it's... Uh, it's Total my, Eclipse of the Heart? Of my, yeah, one of my favorite one of your playlists. Songs? Yeah, Wish You Were Here. Yeah. Total Eclipse from there. No, it's, it's great. Great catalog. Uh, uh, Living La Vida Loca, that's one of yeah. yours? Locomotive Breath, you know. Locomotive Breath. Yeah. And uh, just having a look at this here, where uh, these are coming soon. Morrissey, I mean, uh, how did you manage to do a deal with Morrissey? He's supposed to be the most difficult artist in the world. Yeah, I mean... Artists are very easily denounced as being difficult if, if they're opinionated, you know, if they don't take every shit a major label or, or the industry gives them, you know. He, I, I don't think he's difficult. He just is exactly conscious and clear what he wants. And uh, I mean, if we, we looked at the last 20 years of A&R meetings and then if an artist is very confident in, in actually saying, this is what I stand for, this is what I think connects to my audience, a lot of time there are people on the table who don't take the responsibility, but feel forced to say something different and basically bring in a producer or songwriter and then Morris is just an artist who is completely clear what he wants to express and how he wants to connect with his audience. Not difficult at all. And I'm so glad... And by the way, everybody would say Roger Waters is difficult or everybody would say Mick Jagger is difficult or Bono, right. you know, but right. I mean, the common dominator is they, they have a clear, clear vision of what they want to express and, and don't allow people to interfere with that discussion, you know. I'm so glad to see that you've got Avril Lavigne as one of your upcoming yep. priorities because she created history a few years ago by recording Japanese versions of her singles and also recorded in Chinese in Mandarin. So this is somebody that you can work with in widening BMG's further impact in China and in all of the Asia Pacific countries, right? And she's massively known in China because from day one she paid attention. I mean, that's it. Uh, artists should do that. Point obviously, if you want to be a global artist, you have to pay global attention and, and make an effort, you know. So and she did. So you're going to get your artists to to record some Tagalog or some Bahasa in their material. Well, I won't get them to record. I would suggest maybe they <laughs> should think about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't. Still good. Okay, coming soon, you signed Kylie Minogue, obviously yeah. a legend in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Dustin Lynch, that was the Big country one. act you're talking about? Yeah, new, new uh, country singer from, from Nashville. Huge, huge album coming up uh, uh -huh. this week. Uh, yeah, and Fergie, you know. That's uh, from the Black Eyed Peas? Yep. She's great. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. Wonderful. So maybe that might be a way to get the Black Eyed Peas uh, coming in, although you publish uh, Will I Well, no, no, Will, Will will have a new record out in two weeks with a new huh. singer, so uh, Black Eyed Peas decided they won't wait for Fergie at this point, so we've been very uh, hectic, uh, very hectic uh, autumn coming up. So uh, I just thought it's worth mentioning some of the publishing names that you publish. Frank Ocean. How many of you are familiar with Frank Ocean? <laughs> Only four. That can't be right. Frank Ocean. Hot, hot, hot. Um, Bruno Mars, yeah. who's obviously from the Philippines originally. Yep. John Legend, who we spoke about at the beginning of uh, the session. David Bowie. Yes. Um, Afro Jack. Yeah, huge. Huge. Yeah. Incredible DJ. Yeah. And someone who's Netherlands. done... Netherlands, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, on the record side, you sign Moby. Yep. Big artist. Big artist. Interesting Great thinker. Great catalog. Again, probably an artist people would say is a difficult artist. He's just very clear on what he wants. You Great know what artist. he does now in Los Angeles? He runs a tea shop. A tea shop. In between recording. Good. You go and have a cup of tea at his shop. He diversifies. Great. He diversifies. <laughs> Uh, Fat Boy Slim, yeah. someone else that you yeah. got involved with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, Blink 182. Yeah. Uh, how about Alt J? A L T J. Wonderful, wonderful band. We represent them on the recorded side. Uh, uh, and uh, obviously, third album, very successful. Again, one of those bands where I say it doesn't hurt if you really stay true to yourself. Don't give too much uh, on what what uh, uh, yeah what what people who don't share your risk on the creative side try to advise you. So uh, big big story being definitely not looking all the time at what's the lowest common dominator, but creating an incredible career over the last five years. 
So you see, I love those kind of artists who are opinionated about what they present to their audience. So give us a sense uh, when you meet these people and you're introducing BMG and you basically are not necessarily doing a sales pitch, you're speaking creatively because that's what I've picked up in all of what you've said and what I've heard that people who work with you say is that when they sit down to have a meeting with yourself, they feel they're talking to a kindred creative spirit. What do you say when you get in with not only Morrissey, but let's say, for example, uh, when you sit with an artist, what's your approach? Well, my, my approach starts with respect, and, and I don't rehearse before, so I might not know what I say, but, but I, I think the key starting point is respect, and that means I only engage with those people because I already believe they are great in one dimension. So uh, I, I, I don't feel then obviously in a position to say I start immediately with criticizing haircut, uh, dressing or, <laughs> or songs, you know. So uh, uh, my probably creative advice all the time is uh, stay true to yourself and that might not always work immediately or that might in between sometimes not work, but that's not that's not a problem. I mean, if you see how many failures even some of the big artists have in between their career that 30 years later looks completely uh, one direction, I, I think you should just take risks on the creative side as well and not always look for the lowest common dominator. And, and that's what I try to encourage artists because, I mean, the interesting thing is if, I mean, I'm uh, 32 years now in, in corporate music industry and, and if you spend a lot of time analyzing what's the real value in that industry. So what's the value of catalogs? You find out those catalogs where artists had a very clear uh, position on what they want to do are the most valuable catalogs. And, and that's so, it's beyond being a philosophical position, beyond being a creative advice. Uh, Long term, it's the biggest value is created if those artists are unique and stay true to themselves. And, and, and we try to live that actually in BMG and say, you know, we learn from the finance or financial information we get when we, we buy companies or we look at companies. And I mean, we, we try to buy Parlophone, so we basically had a good view on the value of those catalogs. So when we separate it from, uh, from our Sony BMG venture and sold to Sony, I spent a year on actually assessing what's the value of that company and mainly looking at the catalogs involved. And it really is, I mean, you can really prove the point. Those artists who actually have a position on their creativity and are not like just guided by good meaning A&R people that today think this is cool and next day this is cool, they create the highest value. I mean, the Clash catalog is much more- The Clash? Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at the, those catalogs when we co-owned them. I mean, there are a lot of pop artists, you might think they, they were, they're the biggest thing in the world if you look at their hits, but where the total turnover of the catalog coming to albums and, and long-term relevance is absolutely amazing. Manic Street Preachers, you know, who would think that Manic Street their catalog is a very relevant catalog, you know, so, really? yeah. And I give, can give you a lot of more examples, you know. I could give you the negative examples, but that, that might not be fair. But it's, it's really, I mean, you, you can correlate uh, artistic opinion to long-term commercial success uh, in, in a lot of companies right now, if you look at the catalogs. So when you're sitting down with Kylie Minogue and her manager. I wasn't allowed to sit down with her so far. So oh, I'm still waiting still, for that. Still waiting for that, okay. Mm. But what I'm trying to do is, let's take, uh, uh, someone that you uh, work closely with, uh, uh, let's say with Blink-182, that yep. you've had the success of number one with, you, with all of your creative experience and your own innate musical sensibility, your background as a record producer, you can talk music and talk business and talk data yep. with the managers, with the artists, with the, the legal representatives, is that correct? Yeah, but I try to stay a little bit out of talking the mu music, you know, I mean, Obviously, I say what I like, but, right. but uh, as I said, I, t I try not to, to be too opinionated about what I at, maybe at that moment don't think is my favorite song because I'm completely aware nobody says I'm right, you know. And, and let's face it, I mean, historically, a lot of things were proven right simply by power and spending a lot of money. And again, right. this, this 
currency will not be as as important going forward as it was, you know, because obviously audiences uh, with uh, access to social media and streaming make make their own decisions, and we, I, I think we will see less relevance in the big spendings in marketing going forward compared to 10, 20 years ago. So when you're looking at Asia Pacific, and not just China, and not just Japan, uh, we saw a presentation here at All That Matters from Spotify's Director of Economics showing some of the aspects of, of Asia. Mm. Clearly, the Philippines are a big market. Indonesia, a quarter of a billion people. Yep. Give us some idea of your thinking about how you would ideally like to widen the arc of BMG's development. I mean, obviously, Asia Pacific is a major focus, correct? Absolutely. And you would spend money developing talent from Asia and Asia Pacific and trying to find ways that you can migrate that talent in the way that we saw of, for example, uh, well-known Singaporean artist Lin Ying, who's now bigger internationally than she is in her home country. Yep. Well, I mean, obviously you want to uh, team up with uh, people who have access to local artists, you know. I mean, I, I don't think it makes sense that we hire in every country 10, 15 A&R people. So our idea right now is we set up a hub in Singapore that will interact locally with, with all the countries and, and then source it into BMG, and which immediately means our, our licensing teams from day one will have access to that repertoire. And as I said before, you know, we, we are always surprised how uh, uh, cutting edge TV and film licensing is and, and oh, yeah, going forward uh, advertising as well. But yeah, but if, if you look at uh, specifically English and American film production, right now even TV uh, production, TV series, Netflix formats, and, and, and I mean the music is pretty astonishing compared oh, yeah. to common wisdom what works in North America or doesn't work. You know? Right. No, for example, Game of Thrones, 700 million viewers all over the world. Yeah, well, look at billions and all those series, you know, when, when you dig deep and, 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 and pay attention to the music, this is definitely not the mainstream radio format that, that people try to sell to you as a, the most important marketing tool if you go through the uh, normal label system right now, you know. Right. So I, I think that will be very different. And obviously that connects very fast in social media uh, and then to the pl uh, relevant playlists and, and, and uh, uh, digital offerings. And who runs your company in China at the moment? Uh, Sherry. Is she here? She's not here, no. She's she, not here. It's in LA actually today oh, with the Chinese artists. Oh, with the Chinese yeah. artists? Yeah. That's a fantastic um, initiative to be able to take Chinese acts to LA. Yeah, but I mean, if, if, what is so fascinating about artists coming from this region? Well, I mean, a lot of young people from this region work, live, study outside of this region. So, I mean, if, if you expose Chinese artists in LA, you will be surprised how many young people with Chinese origin show up and create the initial buzz in this. You right. know? So, uh, I mean, same with India, you know? So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a little different, again, than, than, than normally the industry portrays the situation. Right. I don't have primarily to appeal to a North American born kid, if, uh, if I want to expand into North America, where there's a huge community of Italians, French, I mean, actually everybody one day migrated into of course. North America, you know, so, yeah. so you, you basically can find a lot of different ethnic audiences on day one you go there, and, right. and why ignore it, you know? Right. And who runs your company in Japan? Well, we, we don't have a real office there right now. We, we work with Fuji and, and Lies, uh, Yasmina Summit from, from our office in Berlin, uh -huh. spends a lot of time in Japan working on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And over the next couple of months, we probably expand that uh, situation as well. But your goal now is to invest in these markets. You're Absolutely. looking at, yeah. obviously, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Philippines. Uh, Philippines, yeah. clearly, very yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, when I see App the App from uh, the Black Eyed Peas, yes. originally from the Philippines, Philippines correct? Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, these markets, um, other countries, Cambodia, Vietnam, also a growing taste in global music, streaming very important in all of these yeah. markets. Yeah. Well, and obviously it's easy now to get information, uh, how to interact everywhere. You, you have agents, you have uh, little local uh, creative companies, you know, so very, very exciting opportunity coming up. So if you consider all of these various assets, just looking at the artists that you have, uh, 
the playlist, just as an example, you've got playlists on Spotify now that work for uh, some of your copyrights. Um, the goal is to really take the same theme of fairness and openness and taking this uh, into Asia Pacific. I'm sure that there would be many managers and artists who hear this who might not necessarily have had good experiences with other companies saying, we like the sound of this, maybe you like the sound of us. Yeah, well, in, in, in fairness, transparency are two important values, but, but global approach is another very important key competitive element in BMG, you know, to be like a little origin neutral and, and always looking at it from a global perspective. And again, it's, a, it's, it's a basically a, a function of looking at this world, at our industry from a digital perspective. And, and uh, I don't think it makes sense now to go through the mindset of local marketing people uh, if, if, if you want to market global repertoire. You know, of course an Italian person might be more geared to Italian repertoire. Does this mean we don't want to have Fergie released in, 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 in Italy? Of course we want to have it. You cool. know? So, I think there are a lot of ways to do business that don't make sense anymore in, in, in our industry and, and that's why drastic re-engineering re a company probably makes a lot of sense, you know. So right now, if you would say that if you look at BMG, all of your activities, your broadcast music, transcription music division, in addition to your publishing division and your record division, you've got four main hub cities, Berlin, London, Nashville, Los Angeles. Would it be realistic to assume that over the next couple of years you could be saying Beijing, Jakarta, Manila could be additional hub cities for the development of talent from this region? I, I would think so. Probably start with Oh, one. Two. I mean, yeah. Beijing we have, yeah, yeah. And, and probably Singapore definitely as of uh, January will be the hub for this region, and I think it will get incredible traction from day one, yeah. Absolutely, and uh, uh, clearly I think there would be significant interest, particularly because you've shown that you're looking at this uh, from a slightly different perspective from some of your competitors. Yeah, I mean, a legacy company always has very strong local companies, very opinionated companies, and, and, and sometimes it's important just to look at what motivates people, what, 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 what are the sort of the benefits you get, you know, and as, as long as you get benefits for breaking local repertoire, for engaging with local repertoire, that is fine, but if, if it becomes then prohibitive, specifically if you look at the US, for example, and say, okay, now, now coming from the Philippines, you have to fight with the local managements for the budgets or with the big local artists. It doesn't really make sense. You have to, I think you have to create from day one a neutral uh, uh, playing field here. So having a global approach, deciding on global budgets and ignoring local decision making. It's not always very pleasant in the interaction then when, when people join you and say, well, but now I want to be the king of England, <laughs> BMG, or I, yeah. I run the US and you have to tell them, well, you only run talent sourcing in the US and the rest is done centrally. I think it's a very important feature, you know. Well, Hartwig, I must say, just hearing what you say, of course, extremely impressive creatively, but if I look at uh, numbers and what the results are of all of your efforts and uh, all of your hard work, uh, BMG's half-year results for 2017, you generated nearly $300 million in sales that was 28% up on 2016. Your operating profit in the first six months of 2017 was about $50 million. And that translates into a first half 2017 profit margin of over 17%. And yet, you're sharing this all in one way or another with the talent. Yeah, as I said, I don't, I don't think it's a contradiction. I mean, you, yes, you have to be efficient nowadays if you run a music company in the old days of uh, just spending a lot of money to be right are over. Uh, but, but yeah, I think we can have a fair balance of interest in this industry, being profitable, enough for shareholders to invest money, being absolutely aggressive in, in uh, maximizing artist income and actually paying your employees pretty fair, you know? I, I, th I think it works, yeah.
So two of the properties you've got, you've got Despacito, an interest in Despacito, that yes. big hit with Justin Bieber, yeah. translating to Spanish. Maybe you can get that recorded in Bahasa or in Tagalog or in uh, Mandarin <laughs> or in Cantonese. Yeah, sure and then, see. and the DJ Khaled, huge de DJ Khaled in yeah. America. So the future is so bright, you've got to wear shades. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, it looks good, actually, you know, but for the whole industry, you know. And by the way, there was one interesting, uh, interesting chart I saw today in the streaming presentation that was obviously how streaming creates international markets. You know, when, right. when the chart was there, like in the old days, uh, what, what, I, I don't get it right, but it was clearly to be seen, you have to think global to maximize what you invested into by generating more sales out of outside of your originating territory and obviously digital enables you. So it's stupid to ignore it because of local sentiments and, and, and power plays, you know. So that's, it's, I thought it was a very interesting discussion in that meeting. Let's just go to the last slide there, please, Dickie. And I don't know whether you've got Despacito, but Hartwig, we just wanted to say a huge thank you to you because you came all the way to Singapore, all the way to be here at All That Matters. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've got a good sense of this fantastic creative executive. Thank you. Hartwig Masuch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ralph. Sure. And uh, by the way, at some point, here is a fantastic book called This Is BMG, a wonderful book. Uh, if uh, you are interested in getting this, uh, the uh, All That Matters people could be helpful because this is a uh, little bit of a Bible, it's the BMG Bible. Well, let me explain, I, I think this is very important because obviously we try to be different in this industry. We always find out, well, it's, it's very hard and we hire a lot of people. I mean, we grew actually from, from three people in, in 2008 now to close to 700 people. And what you need to achieve is that you share the same view on what you want to achieve. So, uh, and we always found it very difficult uh, to hire people and then just to assume they, they completely understand what we want to do. So we, we actually started a massive initiative to say, you know, if you work for BMG, we really want to explain how we do business, what are absolutely important values you have to respect. So every employee of us gets this book and we ask him, please spend some time and read it. And if you have questions, come back just to be able to work on the same page. So it's one of the key tools we use actually to create that new company. Hartwig, thank you so much. Thanks for coming here. See you soon. Okay.